Good morning. Welcome to the BSI conference, the digital world, cybersecurity, emerging topics. I am Tim McGar from BSI, the UK's national standards body. Given the topic today, for me, a good place to start is, was by referring back to the UK uh, Cybersecurity Breaches Survey, which the UK Government Department DCMS runs every year. And getting an understanding of what's going on today, we can use it as a base to work out what's happening in the future and the emerging topics we're going to discuss. From this year's survey, we learned that four in 10 businesses report having cybersecurity breaches or attacks in the last 12 months. Among those that have identified a breach or attack, around a quarter experienced them at least once a week. Where mid-sized mid or large businesses have faced, faced breaches, the average cost of a cybersecurity breach they've experienced is estimated to be 19 and a half thousand pounds, although it's much smaller for smaller firms. Over the years I've been, I've been looking at this survey, there's been slow but steady improvement in how organizations are tackling cybersecurity. However, this year the improvement seems to have stopped. That being said, cybersecurity is a bit like being on a treadmill. Just to stay where you are, you have to keep running really quickly. Whether that's due to the changing, changing best practice, the fast pace of technology development, or the changing regulatory landscape. Hence the topics we have for discussion today. Uh, next slide, please. So before we get going, I'd like to cover some uh, housekeeping points. As a reminder, this is a listen-only conference that is being recorded. We'd like the day to be as interactive as possible and welcome questions you may have via the Q&A function. To help me and the speakers, please keep your questions as clear and concise as possible. Also, thank you to those of you who submitted your questions ahead of the conference. We'll discuss those as we go on. To pose a question, simply click on the Q&A button in the side panel and post your question. If you experience technical difficulty at any point, please submit your technical issue in the Q&A function and our support team will help you. BSI will be sending a follow-up email after the conference has taken place with a link to the recording. At the end of the conference, you'll be automatically taken to a feedback survey to complete. This is a CPD recognised webinar. Should you want one, please request your certificate via the feedback survey following the webinar. Next slide, please. The speakers we have today have a huge uh, experience in cybersecurity. I won't be going through their biographies. If you go to the website where you signed up, you will see you can learn more about them and their experience. And that's been shared in the chat just now. So I want to introduce our speakers if they could please uh, turn on their cameras. So firstly, we have Olu um, Adeni, Cybersecurity and Digital Transformation Advisor. We have Andrew Rose, Resident CISO, Emir for Proofpoint, and Lee Watford, CISO for Domino's UK and Ireland. So in terms of the format today, you have seen in the agenda the various topics we're planning to discuss. Um, I'll shortly get our uh, three speakers to give some introductory remarks and some of, the, some of the themes we're going to discuss today. And when they'll go through the topics listed, the intention, is, the intention is to be quite a free form um, discussion, but we really want to keep it as interactive as possible. So please send your questions through, either based on the agenda that's going to be listed or on any other emerging topics you think we, we need to discuss. So as I mentioned, I'll ask each of our speakers to give a brief introduction to themselves. So to start with, um, Olo, could you, could you please um, give your opening remarks? Olo, the floor is yours. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Tim. And um, pleased to meet everyone who's on the call. From my perspective, um, we're beginning to see, you know, we're continuing to see a trend of um, continuing attacks and the evolution of those attacks. Um, a really quite solid um, base of um, hackers and attackers using various techniques across the various different types um, of attack, attack, attack um, actors. I'm, I'm pleased to see that the National Cyber Security uh, Centre and the government, they've both published 2022 um, strategies and the government, um, you know, it looks great on paper. Um, I hope it's just as good in terms of implementation. The National Cyber Security Centre has published uh, its own uh, strategy uh, to having just come to the end of a three-year strategy um, last year, the end of last year. I think the, the number of attacks that we're seeing, the type of attacks, um, 
they still have yet to to be fully um, understood by um, the, 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 a lot of the boards that I'm sitting that, I'm, that I come into contact with. Uh, there's still a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding. There's a lot of uh, there's not enough uh, from what I've seen uh, of real sort of governance being put in place. Even though many of the surveys show that um, boards say that cybersecurity is a high uh, is high on their ranking list. But I think that. Um, I think you know we're beginning to see. The other, last thing I'll say is we're beginning. To see, you know we're continuing to see lots of technology solutions out there. Um, I'm not sure that we're seeing enough focus on the people side of cybersecurity. Um, we're putting a lot of effort and a lot of money into technological solutions. And don't get me wrong, I think those are added benefit. Absolutely, they are. Um, but I think we could be leveling that out more and um, switching uh, and looking more about um, the whole people side of cybersecurity. Um, there's something there, a lot more work to do in that space. So those are a few thoughts and comments from me, but much more, I'm sure, as we go through the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Arlo. Um, Andrew, do you want to come in with some of your opening thoughts, please? Absolutely. So uh, good day, all. Nice to meet you. Andrew Rose. I'm the resident CISO for Proofpoint. Um, previously, I've been a CISO at a couple of global law firms. CISO at Air Traffic Control in the UK and CISO at MasterCard as well. Uh, and also I worked for Forrester Research for about four or five years in the middle there. Um, so when I was thinking about what, what are some of the concerns, what are some of the topics that we should talk about today? And there's, there's so many uh, from the cybersecurity world, there's so many issues that we need to consider, whether it's stress management and how nearly uh, is it, Nearly all CISOs work between 10 and 14 hours more than they should, and about it's about 20% work about 20 hours or 25 hours more than they should a week. And that about 50% of CISOs say that the expectations placed upon them from their organizations are excessive. And that, that's one big topic that we need to think about. How are we going to keep CISOs in role if the expectations on them are far too high and the stress levels are too high? Um, I thought about talking about complexity because obviously with the organizations that we have, we're constantly rebuilding services using third parties and more technology and more cloud services. Um, and do we really understand the assets? And do we understand the way the businesses are using these different assets? Do we understand how our whole enterprise hangs together anymore? And the, the assets that make that up? No, I'm not sure we do. We're building complexity, building new, brand new cloud enabled services on top of old legacy systems and integrating them all together and making a Gordian knot of epic proportions of our own technology stack, something that we'll never be able to unpick again. And perhaps nobody who will work there in five years will actually understand how it works. So that's another big topic we could talk about. Um, or taking on from the, the asset management piece and the the lack of visibility of assets, we could talk simply just about vulnerability management, which is a security topic which has been there since day one, and still we haven't nailed it. Still, you know, we're not good at vulnerability management, we're not good at patching. You've just got to ask how many of us out here are still vulnerable to Felina, which is being exploited right now, um, one of the, you know, the latest um, Microsoft vulnerability. I'm sure a lot of people on this call have still got vulnerabilities to Felina. And one of the things that's most scary is to see that the attackers aren't actually using it all that much because they don't need to. They've still got lots of historic vulnerabilities and exploits which are still available to them and still effective. So you know, using the latest one is all nice and good for them, but they don't really need it. So all of these topics could be something we talk about, but I'd like to sort of double down on something that was just mentioned there about the people side, because that's the area I'm so passionate about. I think that there's a massive imbalance in terms of the resource that's applied in cybersecurity these days. We spend all of our time and attention and money on looking after the technology stack and putting that in place. And that's fair, it does a decent job. However, you look at the breach reports, the Verizon data breach report says that 83% of successful attacks have a human aspect to them. And yet, when you look at Gartner, it says about 2% of our budget goes into managing those human factors and those human risks. I think there's a huge opportunity for the professionalization of the security awareness and the human uh, risk factor. You know, even when you look at the people within your own organizations, you know, the firewall admins, they, they go on certified courses, they get training to be better firewall admins. And yet, most people who do security awareness and culture change 
people do it off the side of their desk because they showed an interest in it and we don't invest enough in them. So I think there's a huge possibility, a huge opportunity for us to um, really uh, get hold of the people who look after the cybersecurity awareness, culture and behavior change piece and really escalate them within our organization, give them, uh, give them more uh, opportunities, give them more budget, give them more focus to really drill down into what is probably the biggest issue to our, our cybersecurity at the moment these days, and that's the human factor. That's me. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And Lee, sure there's also lots of those things we said, we heard you said so far that I think we're going to drill down to a bit more. Uh, Lee, um, some open thoughts from you, please. It's almost like you knew what the agenda was, Andrew. <laughs> So yeah, I, I think you do hit on quite a lot of kind of pretty salient points. And um, so yeah, I, everybody that not maybe before doesn't know me, uh, Lee Watford, uh, CISO at Domino's Pizza Group UK and Ireland, um, previous head of information security at Whitbread, Cost of Coffee, Premier Inn, um, and a few mutual. And um, prior to that, I've got a long history of consulting background um, for places like Peter Packard, um, Big Four, Productivity, um, and done lots of, sort of startup stuff as well. So I've, I've kind of seen the industry from pretty much every angle going. Um, and the only thing I don't do, and my team won't let me do, is put hands on keyboard and do anything technically because it's generally pretty disastrous. Um, so, so yeah, I. I there's obviously quite a lot of topics. There's quite a lot of topics that, that we'll cover today. Um, probably kind of just two or three big ones for me. We can't we, we, we can't fund information security within organisations without getting the support of the people that have the money. I think this is the biggest failure that we have as an industry. Is is we spend too much time thinking about as Ollie referred to technology, technology, technology. This is not a technology problem. It's a business problem. Um, you know, the vast majority of cyber breaches, if not everything, has a business impact, whether that's knock on impact because we're spending loads of time running around fixing incidents and um, whether that's time spent, you know, dealing with problems, whether it's 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 just so much time, effort and cost is spent dealing with cybersecurity incidents that happen. So it's very hard to not do cybersecurity without the business. And I think this is where we fail because we do cybersecurity within technology. We don't actually have the relevant conversations with the business. So I think that that's that's really the first big one for me that, that we have to fix. We have to be speaking a business language. We have to be speaking in terms of business impact. We have to be speaking in terms of risk. And the other thing I think we have to be speaking about a lot is threats. You know, we need to understand the business that we're protecting and what that means to the business, what they really care about. We also need to understand what we're protecting against. So I think that the sort of strategy is becoming more aligned to not only risk, but to threats. Um, you know, one thing I keep talking about, there's, um, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a saying in our industry that, that you know, most of you probably heard of is assume breach. So I kind of say, well, if we're assuming breach, that's great. But how do we factor assume breach into our risk conversations when we're looking at likelihood versus versus impact? We're saying the likelihood is we've already been breached then what does that mean in terms of that conversation well it becomes about impact so for me it, it's really all about the threats that we face and the impact that those threats may well impart and the risk that may be realized delivering that business impact and kind of almost the rest of it for me is is, is it's 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 basic controls it's it's aligning to kind of the right standards implementing the things that mean the things to your business so I think fundamentally, those things are absolutely key. And I think we need to be thinking about evolving the frameworks, evolving the way that we're thinking, you know, solving the vulnerability problem by being much, much more targeted. Um, as Andrew talks about, you know, I think a lot of organizations still sat there with massive lists. I've got a massive list, huge list, tens of thousands of vulnerabilities. What do I actually care about? It's about three or four, I think, that I really care about. So it's using that intelligence, understanding our threats, applying that in a business context, and then becoming much more targeted and much more clever about how we use our scarce resource with our unlimited, with our unlimited budgets, I wish, with our very, very limited budgets that are becoming more limited, especially as businesses start to look at recession now, especially as businesses like ours start to look at significant cost increases of things like wheat, et cetera. So it's this, this significant external pressures from the economy 
um, which is putting even more pressure on the security budget. So how do we do more with less? How do we become more targeted? How do we become more relevant to the business? Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think all three of you sort of fit quite well into our first uh, topic as we discuss. Um, could the next slide up, please? Um, so one of the things that um, so Ollie mentioned is the fact that um, you know, there's generally sort of positive surveys around board impact. So I looked at the um, survey I mentioned earlier, which said that 82% 80, of boards or senior management within UK businesses rate cybersecurity as high or a very high or fairly high priority, uh, which has increased on, on, on last year. But as uh, sort of Lee just mentioned, you know, there's there's potentially a you know, recession coming. There's inflation, which pretty much anyone who's, who's running a company hasn't experienced high inflation throughout their career. Um, we have the whole net zero challenge, along with all the other things that organisations have to deal with. So whether it's environmental management, health and safety. So, um, I mean, how in reality, how high a priority do you see cybersecurity being in all these other things that sit within the people, the heads of people on boards? Um, Andrew, do you have some initial thoughts on that? It's, it's a it's a challenging one, isn't it? Because I think um, it used to be if we if we'd had this conversation two years ago, we probably would have said that cyber was possibly the top of the board's agenda. Um, it was the key thing they worried about. Um, and actually, now I don't think that's the case anymore. Uh, we did a, a, a voice of the CISO survey recently, and it came back that uh, it was interesting to see that how many CISOs felt they had the, the backing of the board. Because last year it was it was relatively high, and this year it's actually taken a, a quite a significant step down. And the larger the firm, the bigger step down it's taken. Um, and so now only about fifty percent of CISOs feel that the board have really got their back in those large organisations. And I wonder whether already the boards have had to have had their attention taken away from cyber to more operational, you know, real issues such as COVID, such as remote working, such as you know. Uh, guiding your business through all these these uh, these impacting you know global environment issues uh, and actually cyber has now fallen down the, the 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 list a little bit and the CISOs are feeling a little bit of sting from that and I think we're going to see more of that happening in the next couple of months years perhaps as the, all this the global sort of uh, stuff plays out uh, and recession and you know Ukraine and all of those things have a big impact on our businesses the organization's business is going to or the board is going to have to make decisions for the health of the business and cyber cannot always be number one we have to be making our case better you know, to do the essential things to really uh, provide safety to our organizations i see you're nodding lee is that your experience as well yeah I, you're absolutely right but i, I think i think that this is also a failing of how we are articulating risk to the business. So I, I, I take I take a view that it's not by risk. I mean, I love these little you see, you see these little kind of um, sort of snippets of, of stuff on sort of LinkedIn. Say, you know, who's sleeping soundly in their bed at night, and it's the CISO that's, that's the one that's away 24 hours a day because they're really worried about everything. I take exactly the other view. It's the business that should be worried about everything because. It's their business. The impact is to them. It's to their business. It's to their profits. But well, actually, it's not to their profits. It's to our profits because I very much see myself as a as a critical part of as a strategic business advisor to the business, to the PLC and our operational boards. So if I'm articulating this correctly, this is risk to them, to their operations. And my job is to advise them on the risk that they're exposed to, what that really means in a business language, and give them options as to what they want to do about it. And if, it, if they want it to slip down their agenda, that's completely up to them. My job's to advise them. So if I'm advising them correctly, they're making the decisions because actually they own the risk, really. And I think and I think that's where we need to be. And I think we have to be driving more down that road because, you know, it, it, it's just it's not all about the CISO running around having sleepless nights, working ridiculous hours every day. You know, it should be us just providing advisory and letting them make the decisions based on the intelligence and, and the and the subject matter expertise that we're providing. And if they choose to accept a risk, that's great. That's their risk. They've chosen to accept it. I've provided the advice. They've accepted it. We move on. Or they want to take a, they've got a lower risk appetite for some elements of the business. And we've got quite a broad business from 
manufacturing to logistics to supply chain to franchisees to e-com platforms so we have a different risk profile for each of those kind of areas of our business so i i, I leave it to them to make those decisions and then you know i, I support appropriately so Olo, i mean i know you've experienced with lots of different sizes of uh, organizations as well i mean how are you seeing um board involvement in cybersecurity across the piece are you seeing any sort of differences between different sizes of organization or sectors or anything else well um yeah i mean i think that um um if you look at um first of all i mean first of all that survey you mentioned earlier on where a lot of um, a lot of board members or ceos rate cybersecurity as high the first question is do they actually really understand what cybersecurity is uh, and that's the that's the first question that I that I would ask. And and do they do they see that, that cybersecurity should sit along, um, as Lee was saying, as a risk you know, as a risk vector alongside those other uh, those other issues? Um, if you don't have sales, right, your your business will fail. Uh, if you don't do uh, you know if you don't support your customers, uh, you know, especially depending on what sort of um, business you have then your you know your business will fail so the question is do they see those 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 um do they see cyber security along that same that same level but there are i mean if you, you can look at the dcms survey um certainly when you look at last year's you'll see that there are differences in terms of the resources that they allocate um in, in different size size businesses and also in different sectors um in some sectors for example you'll see that they'll have uh, an individual on the actual board who is actually uh, responsible for cyber security you don't see that very often um in some businesses at all and um and i think as well that um when you see the the i mean when you look at the survey that the, the, the current survey you'll see that the, the figures are very similar in terms of you know the increases in reported um issue, cyber security issues um but at the end of the day what really concerns me is whether or not the board understand what cybersecurity means in all its fullness, um, and do they understand the risks that the business is facing? Do they really understand those risks, um, and do they see it um, as a strategic part of them trying to achieve their goals? Um, a, a key thought really should be for any CEO is well, what do you know? What do we need? To, this is our plan. What do we need to succeed? Right? And if they if they're not including cybersecurity in that. Um, and they're leaving that risk out, then what they're effectively saying is, in my view, I've not fully understood what cybersecurity is all about. That, that, that you shouldn't have to have a CISO who's banging his head against the wall, um, trying, you know, really, really hard to try and get the board to understand, um, or trying to get them to accept, um, or to understand the risks involved. Um, so, so yes, there are variations. Um, smaller businesses, of course, smaller and medium-sized businesses, I think um, they don't have the same options. A lot of the technology spend that you see, um, and a lot of the new technologies that you see out there, like SASE, you know, uh, Service Access, Service Edge, and Zero Trust Network Access, and all that sort of stuff, a lot of those are options for large businesses because they're, they're not cheap. <laughs> um, smaller businesses uh, don't have those options, um, all of the options that the large organizations have, but I'm sure we'll get onto more of that later on. <clears throat> And I, uh, on, on that piece, I know that the SEC wrote a, some guidance recently, uh, which stated that boards need to have um, not only somebody who's accountable, but someone with real cybersecurity experience on the board. Yeah. And that's not um, that's not been ratified and sort of cascaded out yet, but that's still in the draft uh, format from the SEC, I believe. That's right. But the regulations tends to go global and tends to cascade down. So I, I think it's probably not far off that we'll receive um, legislation and guidance which suggests that we do need a, a, you know, a CISO perhaps on the board you know like the CIO stepped up when the business recognized that hang on most of our business is now technology based the CIO now needs to be involved in every decision perhaps that that day when the CISO is on the board is not too far away I think we just have to ask ourselves whether we're capable of being real board members who are able to have conversations about the whole plethora of issues that the board members have to talk about yeah, I think that's a big challenge about pulling kind of, I'd say, pulling security out of IT because that's where tradition is, that's where yeah. it still is in a lot of instances. And do we have the skills as the CISO community, as you say, to sit on the pulse to have intelligent business conversations about risk, about business impact? Because businesses face risk all the time. Every time businesses make a change, there's risk. You know, you want to enter a new country, you know, you want to introduce a new product line, you know, you take steps to mitigate that risk by, I don't know, you know, we have tasting sessions for new pizzas all the time, which is maybe why 
been about three stone heavy since the joint domino. Um, but but we have these. But the reason we have these is to mitigate the risk of change. We're trying to drive change to improve our business. We need to mitigate that risk. So we have tasting sessions. It's exactly the same principle in the cyber world. You know, yeah. we face risk. We, there's, there's risk that's out there. There's threats to our business. There's threats to our business that people don't like our new pizza. So we spend a lot of money and that involves financial risk um, and opportunity cost of not doing something else that, that could have worked. So those types of decisions, it's exactly the same types of decisions, but that's the conversation we need to be having. And that's yeah. that natural evolution of CISO out of CTO under CIO. And then I think ultimately it's working its way rightly so right up to that sort of that partnering role with the CIO rather than being under IT. Um, so yeah, I, I, absolutely right, Andrew. And I think that's exactly where we're headed. And just to say that we, we might, I mean, to, to add to what Andrew was saying, as, you, as some of you will know, there was um, a call by the TCMS to look at um, to look at extending the NIS. Um, I know that's down there somewhere on, on that agenda, the Network and Information Security. Um, um, and in that, they want to sort of widen the scope and they want to include more of what they call RDSPs, which is relevant digital service providers in that. Um, that's lots of managed service providers. And maybe we'll see more of those organizations. Um, um, and therefore, now that they're going to be under more regulation, um, actually increase the level at which cybersecurity um, you know, actually sits on the board. But it's, it's crucial to, to, to get it. I mean, there's, there's no point in someone, you know, sort of in the middle of the organization trying to shout about cybersecurity. They won't get any resources, <laughs> they won't get any airtime whatsoever. It really does need to be understood from the top. And the last thing I'll say is that I'd like to see that question that they ask in that in one of those surveys, not, not how high do you see cybersecurity? I'd like to see them ask, how much do you think you understand the risk and have a, a rating for maybe one to 10? That would be an interesting result. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I think that would be that would be a way better metric. I think for those, so, so some of these questionnaires, it, it, it's great. I, I personally don't hold much um, don't hold much weight in, but it is always interesting to hear this stuff. And again, is it the right question? And I'm not convinced we ask the right questions all the time. I mean, it's, it's probably about the only plug in to make the standards. But I mean, the work that we do is focused around you know the individuals and the work you know, the 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 approach the organisation is taking, where it's going, the risks, and getting those people people involved. Um, sort of slightly sort of transitioning onto the, onto the sort of next part about people the people centric approach. It sounds like that some of the things you're talking about here is we have you know historically cybersecurity sit with more of the, the IT side and it's moving away from that. And there needs to be a whole new set of skills that are not only developed but recognised within within the area itself. And part of that is about you know influencing people within the organisation but also influencing upwards. I mean, I mean, do you do you sort of see that trend of um, moving away from you know? And I see this. I deal with lots of tech tech sectors where you know the engineer is is, is king basically, and technical expertise is all. I mean, how far do you think cybersecurity sector is moving away from that to having much more of a you know more people centric approach? I, I guess I think there's there's a, a way to go on that one really. I mean, just look at the stats. So, eighty-three percent of attacks from the, the Verizon Data Breach report was human factor. I think the the World Economic Forum said ninety-five percent of uh, of breaches have got human factor in them as well. It, you, you just look at the, the training that we put out that the people who do the roles, the people who do the technology side, are trained, invested in, are you know, professionals. The people who do awareness, th there's still not that many professional security awareness people out there. There's, there's more of them coming, thank the Lord, but um, you know, there's still a lot of people who just do this. They'll just crank the handle on a phishing simulator, send out the e-learning, tick the box, and we're done. You know, there's, there's a huge amount of opportunity for the professionalization of those those people to take more responsibility, more accountability, to really start addressing that side of the issue. No, I totally agree, and I think that um, because and this this relates to something that Lee said earlier on. For organisations that see cybersecurity as an IT uh, issue, it's actually it actually can be counterproductive to increase in the cybersecurity of an organisation. And I'll give you an example. Uh, this is a real example. I won't. I'm speaking general terms here. I don't want to ID any any companies that I've worked with, obviously. But um, IT, you know, IT director says we need to increase security in this area, and so therefore they make it much harder for 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 employees to do their work um, by changing a certain uh, mechanism. Those employees, um, according to research, suggest that a lot of them they won't use that they won't use that system at all. 
they're being you know pressured from from the organization other parts of the organization to get their job done so what they will do is they will turn to shadow it they will use the online systems which that organization has no control over doesn't even know anything about i do what wonder what would happen if um if an organization said let's have an amnesty of what it solution and you know, what it solutions you're using right and then to see what comes out of the woodwork but um to try and increase cybersecurity without involving uh, the, the people, the staff that you're working with, and getting the feedback from them, uh, I think it's a dead loss. It's, it's, it's a, you know, it's a non-starter. So I think COVID drove a lot of shadow IT, but I, I see shadow IT as a huge opportunity for, for learning within an organisation. Yeah. Because if you can find out what services the people are really using, that shows there's a shortfall in your application portfolio. You know, perhaps we're not giving them enough instant messaging tools. Perhaps we're not giving them enough um, you know, uh, file sharing capability. You know, so you should really go out there and embrace shadow IT, not with a, we're going to stop it happening, but as in, we can learn from you and we'll bring these services in-house and control them properly. Uh, but yeah, there's, you're right, people will find the easiest way to do the job. It's like water going downhill, it will find the easiest path. People will find the best, most efficient way to do their job because that's what they're incentivized to do by their management. I always We've like seen... to say the big brother approach to that, Andrew. It's always quite entertaining. So many, many moons ago, when I was looking at internet, outbound internet access controls, I was like, well, it's great. So you can put all these things in and people find a way around it. Like you can block all these websites, but you're doing categories. It's all just rubbish, basically, because the internet's just blowing up at the time. And it was like, well, we can do that. And people will spend loads of time trying to get their way around it. And they will find a way around it. And everyone's going to waste their time, not only doing what they want to do anyway, but actually spend a lot more time trying to find a way around it. So it's massively counterproductive yeah. in terms of productivity. So what do we want to do? Well, let's just tell people we're monitoring them. Do what you like. There's policy. We're monitoring you. There you go. Problem solved. <laughs> so, yeah. so it's just that different approach, isn't it? But I think in more general terms for me, people, um, we are seeing a bigger rise, I think, in the BSO role, so the Business mm -hmm. Information Security Officer role. Um, we just put one of those in place full time at the start of this year. No roles to go and talk to the business about what the business care about, about what they want, about what jobs they do, about who they're hiring, about all of that business related stuff, um, which is the valuable feedback because that's how we get closer to the business. We put a security champions network in place as well. So actually putting advocates for security out into the business. So I think there's a lot more of that going on, I think. Um, and I think we're seeing quite a bit of success. Um, with that approach um because it's helping with the business side of the intelligence around how we then mold and shape our services to to meet their requirements that they now know that they have but the other side of it is people are everything people are the people that choose the technology people are the people that hire people people are the people that have the purse strings that give me the money to buy things from people <laughs> so yeah. it, it everywhere you look this is people it, it you know regardless of, of cyber security businesses are run but they're created by people somebody sits there and says i've got a great idea i'm going to start up a business that's i don't know re-educating you know people that are, that are about to be released from prison or whatever it is but that's a business about people it's run by people it's created yeah. by people so yeah. it is absolutely 100 percent a people thing yeah. but i think under okay. the surface we have to look at that balance between people being the front line of security and technology being the front line of security because i think that changes and i think that is changing fairly significantly yeah. at the moment yeah. which is the topic we'll come on to later i, I think there's more what... sorry, sorry go on. After. Okay. I was just about to quickly say about um, it, it goes back to the risk um, the, the risk assessment as well and understanding what risks there are in your organisation. Um, I'm, I'm full of little stories, right? These are real life stories, okay? So someone decides to um, share a document. He's working remotely and uh, doesn't know how to sort of do that within his in. You know, he's not he's not at work. Doesn't know how to do that. So he puts it on a Dropbox. It's a confidential document, and he fires the link off to a few of his colleagues via email or, or chat. The document is in the open domain, it's not protected, and it's got confidential information. And ideally, that ought to be, you know, depending on the impact, that could be something that's reported. Now, just try and multiply that through people using IT services that you know nothing about, all your sensitive, inf potentially your sensitive information being stuck on, 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 on these. And who knows how secure those, those, particular, um, you know, those, those particular services are that are being used. So I think I agree with Andrew that there is an opportunity, but it's understanding the risk. And um, it's probably better <laughs> if the organisation knows about it than, than not. But again, it's a people cybersecurity issue.
I, I, I do think from the, the human side, we, we do, we've re-architected our businesses differently in the past four or five years. And it used to be that if you were a hacker, you'd, you'd try and break into the data center or try and break into the office to get to the, the crown jewels data. But we've re-architected our business now with cloud services and mobility to actually put the user at the center of our network because wherever they happen to be now, they can access all of the resources they need to. So now identity has become the new corporate perimeter and attackers have, have pivoted to that. Um, you know, no longer do they need to figure out what firewalls we're using, that's sort of irrelevant now. They just need to figure out who they want to attack, who's got the privileges they need to steal. And that's the most well-advertised security perimeter we've ever had because our users go out there on social media and say, oh, right. I'm a database admin, I'm a payroll admin. They, they advertise themselves to the criminal um, criminals out there. So I always have conversations now about saying we shouldn't call our people you know, the, the first line of defense or the last line of defense or the weakest link. All of those are sort of incorrect. We should really talk about our people now as being our primary attack surface because that's where all the attacks come. They all target our individual people or, or employees and look to leverage the information that they can steal uh, to, to get them to engage. And there's, there's, there's Len, we could go on for hours then about the sort of psychology behind those attacks and how they work. But you know, how many people within the cybersecurity team have got somebody who has actually studied human psychology and understands all of those things that the attackers will be using to try and leverage? Not many, not many. Most people just think, well, I'll put them on an e-learning course and we're done, aren't we? We, we definitely need to professionalize this area. So one last thing I want to sort of raise about the people-centric approach, um, which is one of the points that Andrew mentioned about the stress of the job. Um, I, mean, I mean, how can that be counted? Because obviously that's hugely important for both us individuals and the organisations themselves. Is that just about, is that one just about, is that about having the right staffing and resources? I mean, how can that be um, dealt with, sort of all the pressures of the jobs? Goodness, there's there's a long question, isn't there? How do you deal with sort of stress yeah. management? Um, yeah. There's so many sort of things out there, isn't there, about you know mindfulness and healthy eating and physical exercise and all those things, which are all well and good. But I, I I really do think that probably we need to think about delegation. I was having lunch with a CISO colleague recently. We were talking about the Ukraine conflict, and we were asking about why so many Russian uh, leaders, generals, had been killed in the conflict. And we were talking about actually it's because they don't have a strong delegation um, process in place. So when they need something to happen on the front line, the actual the top man has to go there. And we were wondering whether that is actually also reflected in CISOs. Do CISOs actually still get involved in those frontline decisions? Or have we managed to step away and be a more strategic thinker? I don't think we have. I think most CISOs that I speak to still have that the operational heart within them. They want to be involved in the front line. They they get involved in all those day-to-day -day decisions. So that just increases the stress on them and increases you know, the stress on the front line as well. I think there's a way for, you know, we need to delegate better, but that then brings with you a lot of other sort of challenges around staffing numbers and stuff, which is a whole other kettle of ducks. Yeah, and I think it's, it's a leadership thing, isn't it? Yeah. I think that's the thing. You know, We need to be business leaders. We need to be strategic business leaders. Obviously, it will vary, right, depending on the size of the organization and, and all of that sort of thing. But generally, for, you know, for larger businesses, we need to be strategic thinkers. We need to be strategic advisors with the board to the board. So, and that in itself, as you say, if, if you're doing that, and we're looking at that, that, that understanding of risk and understanding of business impact and articulating all of this stuff to them so they can make intelligent decisions and then supporting the implementation of whatever it is to fix the thing that they've agreed to fix. Um, then, yeah, we need to be, you know, we need to be stepping away from the front line. And again, it's a different type of thinking. It's business leadership. And with most CISOs having come from a technical background without experience of running a business or being in a business or, or having that, it's really hard because the, la the languages are completely different. You know, never mind the language of kind of technology to risk, we're actually now kind of migrating from technology to risk to business language, like real business language of being part of that tight knit business leadership unit and having those leadership skills. And again, it, it's a it's a it's a huge departure from where we've been, and we're 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 on the journey, I think, but it's very very slow. Strategic CISOs are still a rarity, really. So yeah. many of them are still involved on the front line. 
you know, who have no time for strategic thinking, they're too busy putting out the fire that's in front of them that day. You know, they are, they're a pretty rare breed strategic CISOs. A quick, quick mention, um, I, a quick mention on, for those who are looking to have a look a bit more about um, security, people's, people's side of cybersecurity. Um, if you Google uh, CPNI, uh, and Google either Homer, it's the Holistic Management for Employee Risk, or the Five E's. Um, they've done research. Um, they've done a lot of research, CPNI, um, and they've come up with, backed by you know, they've spoken to people in the field, in the industry, and with academics, and they've come up with these Five E's, right? Uh, in terms of education, enable, um, shape the environment, encourage the action, and then evaluate um, as a really as a really nice little framework. And they've got lots of suggestions. If you find the PDF, um, which shows an organization how they can embed security behaviors uh, and change that security culture within an organization. Yeah, it is. And I was just going to mention as well. So, I, I, Andrew, you mentioned about the psychology aspect of it. Understanding your threats, you have to understand how the threat environment works. You have to understand what they do and why they do it. What motivates a threat actor to pick up a laptop and decide to hack you? What motivates a 12 year old or a 16 year old a la Lapsus to actually sit there and, 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 and do this stuff? And I think that's key. If we can understand the motivation and uh, the modus operandi, but the motivation, and that's all that psychology element. And interestingly enough, I was doing some work with the students at the University of Portsmouth um, and, and they've just introduced the first non-technical masters in cybersecurity. And it is exactly that. It's focused on the threat and it's focused on the psychology behind the threat actors. If we can understand them, because the Chinese were doing this back in 2000s and thousands of years ago, understand your enemy and you'll understand how to defend against it. And that all comes down to why they do what they do. If we can understand that, uh, there's some interesting stories from a Domino's perspective, and um, which I haven't got time to go into now, uh, especially around the Ukraine war um, and, and the threats made by Anonymous. Um, around that whole psychological kind of impact piece. Um, yeah, it, it, but that's where we need to be. We need to be living in their space, understanding them, because only then can we protect the things that we're worried about. And it's applying that, that psychology sort of understanding to our, our users as well, because they become unwitting accomplices in these attacks because they've been manipulated. And so we need to understand how those manipulations happen and what we can do to stop those manipulations. And again, we don't do that from just sending out some phishing tests. There's more to it, there's more deep thinking that needs to happen, more expertise that needs to be brought to the table. So just slightly sort of um, transitioning to the next topic. So one of the things I've heard around um, cyber insurance is that there can be an, there can be an effect whereby um, those ransomware gangs will work out what they can get from the insurance company before they make an attack, and then that will affect the figure they ask for. Mm -hmm. So um, cyber insurance has been growing for a, at least a decade now, and it sort of started off in the US. And I looked up, according to Marsh, the price of cover in the US grew by 130% in the fourth quarter of 2021, and the UK grew by 92%. And that was mainly due to, to the rise of ransomware. Um, and, e and equally, you know, as time goes on, this is normal with the insur insurance market, which is cyclical, that some providers aren't writing business. Um, I mean, how important do you think that cyber insurance currently is in the sort of um, the arsenal of weapons and that an organization has and the ways it manages risk? And, you know, you know, probably a bit controversial, is actually cyber insurance being less of an option a good thing or a bad thing? Um, so that's a, that's a long and complicated question of introducing uh, cyber insurance. Um, uh, Lee, do you want to sort of kick off on that one? So your perspectives on that? Yeah, how, how long have we got on this topic? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's fun. It's fun. It's cyber insurance. It's it's a crazy space. Um, we've seen a lot of um, a lot of big changes. Um, Merck took their insurance provider to court. It didn't pay out on not Petra one to the tune of $1.5 billion. Um, so there's been an awful, awful lot of insurance companies running for cover. And I think that eventually, well, that's very quickly, so eventually, um, spurred Lloyds of London to completely rewrite all their underwriting terms and conditions. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's huge change. There's, and they are still very much playing catch up, um, I think. So we, we're actually just going through the price at the moment. And I think in answer to the, um, you know, what's the cost of cyber insurance? About 350 grand. There you go. There's a number. So what? So what? Yeah. Why would we yeah. spend 350 grand as a board? Well, 
that's a that's a reasonable chunk of cash for anybody. Um, but that's got to come with intelligent decision making. And ultimately, insurance is a risk transfer mechanism. So going back to Rollo's point, if we don't understand the risk that we're exposed to, how can we make an intelligent decision on whether the cost of risk transfer to the tune of you know, 350 grand a year or whatever it is, is actually worth it? Well, the answer is we can't. So what happens is, is the insurance companies run around selling insurance policies because they'll sell an insurance policy to anybody that can listen. The problem is, is they don't really know what they're selling um, and people don't really know what they're buying. So people take advantage of that um, to sell policies. And the devil in the detail is always the case with insurance, isn't it? It's always about the detail. And that is about understanding the threats. It's about understanding what you're actually trying to protect as a business, the cost of the impact to the business on that threat, realizing an attack, and therefore the risk, and therefore then that decision can be taken. It's a crazy world out there. In, in terms of cyber insurance and it's a it's a fun journey but um but yeah that's every organization needs to do it but people take insurance for the sake of taking insurance because they're incredibly risk averse and that's that's their decision i think as a business i prefer to try and make an intelligent unfortunately my board does as well they can put some intelligence behind the decision um so yeah it's an interesting process but i still they are still pretty they're getting better very quickly because I think they've realized the cost of it now um, and I think they've kind of gone from a lot of protection to a lot of exclusions and I think now the way that they're assessing organizations in terms of maturity helping them through that journey as well as so a lot of professional services coming out of insurance companies now a lot of cyber response requirements you know using their own incident responders for instance um using their own breach negotiators with ransomware and um, threat actors etc so they're expanding massively they've realized a lot of losses in this space i think they're having to play catch upon that now and it's it, it's probably going to be another i would suggest probably a couple of years before it, it kind of gets to where it needs to be in terms of a, re a, a good solid industry um but equally if the boards don't understand risk how do you actually take out insurance yeah i, I think um what, one of the some of the just building on some of the points um or amplifying some of the points lee made there i mean when you buy insurance for anything anyway you've always got to look at well what are you covered for all right now what really complicates that in the cyber security perspective is so the incidents happened right so what incident response plan do do you have and does what's being offered by that insurance that's all bundled in, does it actually fit in with your incident response? Have you just bought, you know, sort of the blue sky marketing material, um, or have you actually drilled down into the policy to find out what it, what it you know, what, what it is that you're actually buying? And you might need to sit there with your lawyer, um, and you certainly will need to sit there with someone that understands what some of those terms are in that insurance policy. I mean, every time I renew my, I'm pretty good at the house policy, renew my house insurance now. But when you look at a cyber insurance insurance policy, there's lots of things in there which you may assume all of it sound good, but when you actually have an incident, a lot of them might not actually be be of any relevance. And when you look at the costs, um, as Lee was talking about, of cyber insurance, you have to take a really good strategic decision, I think, to understand: Do I spend, you know? Do I, do I buy this level of insurance, that level of insurance? So I had to put those extra dollars in to try and to prevent the attack in the first place um, and understanding how, you know, how I can improve my resilience. So a lot of detail in there. Um, I think it possibly can be uh, uh, useful, absolutely. Um, but but the, other, the, last, the, the other point though is of course, do you run, do, you know, does your organization really understand what the impact would be of a certain level of attack? And does the, does the insurance really cover that? Um, there's so many, you know, in, intangibles um, in terms of the outcome of a cyber attack that could last for for several years. Uh, who who knows um, the, the real impact on your on your on your customer base, and and you know how does that affect the cyber insurance uh, that you're buying, or what does the cyber insurance cover uh, in, in terms of that incident response plan? We are we are seeing quite a few CISOs actually getting uh, a bit disappointed by the, the escalating costs of cyber insurance and the escalating exclusions, um, which the, organize with the organizations insurers are doing just to try and maintain profitability because the whole, the whole uh, case is not terribly profitable right now because of ransomware costs. So we're seeing some of them actually step away and going back to self-insurance 
uh, which is what effectively they were doing before. They just didn't realize it. But now they're doing it with a bit more um, you know, focus and understanding that, okay, we're going to save our £350,000 a year. We're going to put it into a slush fund. We're going to invest in different services. We're going to buy different controls with this. So we're seeing self-insurance sort of resurging a little bit. And I think another influence on that is the fact that CISOs don't always have a great deal of confidence that, that uh, insurance will be there when they need it. Again, our voice of the CISO survey um, came back and suggested that 58% of CISOs are confident that their cyber liability insurance will be there if they have a ransomware claim, 58%. So, you know, that's not even uh, you know, six in 10 is, is confident that their insurance policy is actually worth the value of, of their paying for it. It's going to step up when they need it. So there's, there's, a, there's a very interesting sort of uh, tension in the whole market. But the, the insurers can't allow this to, to die because this is the golden goose. This is the future of the insurance industry. Software is eating the world. And you've got, they've got to be there applying insurance policies against software, against the security issues that apply to software. So they have to make this work. And they're, they're doing a decent job right now. Or they're doing a better job. But I think there's still a long way for them to go. They're still asking very, um, very generic vanilla questions. Um, of organizations you know, asking about Active Directory when the place they're insuring has no Active Directory in it, but they say, well, no, in the questionnaire, we need it to be filled in. So this, it's a really interesting area, which I keep on saying my 18-year-old self would be very disappointed that I found that here's me finding insurance interesting. But actually, it is a very interesting area. It's interesting to see how it's going to change in the future. Yeah, I just uh, reviewed our insurance policy that we've, we've just been offered yesterday. It's, uh, it's a fun read. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I think I, I think the other thing, it's a it's a board business policy, it's a business insurance policy. Again, it comes back to this how it's viewed within the business. You know, it's our, our company secretary and, and our board that's reviewing the spend that they need to make on an insurance policy to insure their business. Um, again, I, it kind of goes back to the same thing. It's about the CISO advising the board on risk and the business taking ownership of sorting it out, um, not on the CISO to you know to kind of kind of own that stuff. Um, but but again, we yeah, everybody views it slightly differently. I just wanted to pick up on Tim's point as well. Um, I'd be interested in, in your guys' views on this because you see I've kind of got one view. Um, the bit around threat actors targeting people with insurance policies. There was, a, I think there was a breach of an insurer's database, wasn't there, around who was actually insured and to what levels they were insured to. And then the threat actor went straight after those companies because they know that they were going to get a payout pretty quickly. So, yeah, I think that actually realised itself um, in, in the real world, didn't it? Um, I, I can't remember, it was a while ago, wasn't it now? But that's a very real thing, going after companies that have insurance because they know they're going to get a payout. And it's really quite simple. There was one firm that got uh, had a ransomware problem. The attackers had stolen all the data, and when they phoned up and said, or when they emailed in and said, "Right, well, here's our ransom demand," the organisation went back going, "Well, we can't afford eight million dollars." We went, "Well, actually, we've got a copy of your insurance policy in front of us because that's yeah. part of the data we stole." Yeah. Absolutely, you can because that's what you're insured for. So, uh, but you wouldn't mind. So <laughs> yeah. they, they look for that in the data they steal. Yeah. I think, I think the takeaway from this, I think the takeaway from this really is that um, insurance is there as an element, but, but yeah. just to think you're going to buy insurance and, and, and it's going to be hunky dory. Um, I, I was speaking to a colleague of mine who is a FTSE 100 company, remained nameless. They had a breach. In fact, I said they had a breach. They, they had a breach, but they were confident that their data was stolen. Even still, um, they had daily calls for several months. Um, people left the organization through stress, not just the CISOs who get stressed, but the, those guys who were you know, tasked with um, trying to sort that out. And, you know, and how do you insure against that? Right? <clears throat> so you know, it's one element, but you need to have a more holistic plan, I think, um, to, to really understand how, how you're going to mitigate and improve in cyber resilience. Absolutely. Well, that's, I was going to say this leads on to the next point, doesn't it, really? Because it is one part yeah. of your cyber resilient strategy, but it's, you know, yeah. it's, the, it's the backstop. It's the safety net that's after everything else has been put in place. So yeah. it can't be relied upon uh, to stop events or to help you recover, particularly. It just gives you a bit of money with which you can yeah. invest once, once it's all gone horribly wrong. And hopefully but those thank claims, yeah. No, thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for your a great transition there. Um, I mean, we also as on the agenda, we looked at cyber, um, cyber resilience and um, supply chain. And um, supply chain is one of, the, one of those other things where, you know, COVID has, sh has shown how we've moved from this world of um, 
low inventory and you know global supply chains to more of a um a, di a different approach and you know so the breaches survey which i mentioned earlier found that only 12 percent of organizations review risks from for immediate suppliers while one in 20 20 addressed risks coming through the wider supply chains and you know you know one of the things that i think organizations found uh, over the pandemic was that they didn't realize that further down the supply chain there was one supplier that um was a huge risk for them i mean and how and how are you seeing that that evolution both of um supply chain and more broadly around cyber resilience so seeing as andrew transitioned so well could you sort of go first on please oh supply chain is one of the toughest problems that CISOs and security leaders face right now i, I did a uh, a presentation a couple of weeks ago and i asked for sort of some survey data from the people in the room to say well how many of you understand your how confident do you understand your supply chain and it was a really low percentage that replied back saying, yes, we're confident we've got our supply chain. It was less than 10%, I think. People do not understand what the supply chain is. And, you know, you think the complexity and how we're outsourcing so many more services that make up our own value proposition for our own enterprises. But we're just increasing the attack surface area, really. You know, especially when we talk about people being the, the attack surface, because there's so many more people now that we have to be accountable for and the attackers can hack into our supply chain steal the trust and then leverage that to attack our own organization it's incredibly complicated and i i don't know what the real solution is because how deep can we go in supply chain assurance you know, we can ask the questions about whether they've got twenty seven thousand. we can ask to see a, a recent pen test that's fair but you look at solar winds how would we ever have got to the depth of understanding the code that was being written in their applications to make sure that that was not going to come back and bite us? There's only so far we can go with the resources we have. And this, this sort of links back to the insurance industry, I think. I think there's a, a huge opportunity for the insurance industry to add lots of value in this space in the coming years. If they can start to get to a really good model of understanding risk within enterprises, they can then actually supply that information to us in our own organizations so we can assess the risk of the supply chain, the suppliers that are working with us. It's it's a tough problem. I don't have any great solutions for how we do this. I, I, just good old you know due diligence, triage of vendors, all that sort of stuff is, is a great way to start, but there's a long way to go. Yeah, and I think except for me, Andy, the, the risk bit, I mean, we've, we've got thousands of suppliers of which a very small percentage actually would really have any significant business impact. Um, you know, there might some impact, we might have a bit of data loss, you know, we might might suffer a little bit of disruption, but nothing in there that's really critical to our business operations. And if they're critical to our business operations, and again, you know, looking at and understanding the risk and this, this feeds from things like, um, uh, sort of security scorecards and you know organizations of this world that kind of take an external snapshot um of organizations and understand if they've ever sort of based on publicly available information um, and data on the internet and external facing sort of bits of infrastructure they might have what that kind of that risk looks like and we can then take a reasonably educated guess as to if we think that they've got good kind of security practices in place and how protected they are against ransomware themselves and things like that. I mean, if I look at our food supply chain, you know, cheese providers, what if our cheese provider got hit by ransomware and they were down for two weeks, IT systems down, couldn't provide us with cheese, what then? So this is then that resilience bit, because it, it's about business resilience and it's about the, the cyber threat impact to the business and how do we make ourselves more resilient? It's not only about, I think a lot of times when we think about um, sort of supply chain in the traditional IT sense, we look at who has access to what systems. And that's critical, absolutely critical. But actually, what if they were to get breached? What if a threat actor was to get access because their accounts have been breached onto our IT systems? Well, that's fine. We can have that conversation and, and that, that becomes a bit more about entry points, but actually a lot of the same fundamental IT risks that, that we're trying to address. But actually it's the, the, the business side of things, I think that is equally as important. It's, it's what if those food supplies go down? What if we can't? What if we can't supply? Um, uh, what if we can't uh, get trucks to our stores and supply the goods to our stores because our software as a service provider who manages our logistics system has gone down, for instance? Hmm. Well, okay, well that's not a traditional risk, but it's a massive business risk. 
so if it's, it's about thinking about critical business process what does your business really care about i mean i, I ask our uk to on a regular basis what suppliers could you not do without think about what you do either property business or a marketing teams or whatever it is which suppliers are you really bothered about where's your key data if that marketing plan was to go walk about because it's stored with the third party provider, what would that mean in terms of our ability to get ahead of the competition um, or stop them sealing the designs for our next pizza that's being launched or whatever it is, you know, our property teams. Um, so looking at the broad aspects of the business, so if I ask the business what they care about, that's a pretty good start, I think. And then I can look at sort of IT providers and say, who's got access to our systems? Who's supporting, I don't know, our, our databases or who's got, who, 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 which of our development sort of third party outsource providers have access to what areas. So that's critical, but equally it, it's about the business. So ask IT, ask the business and kind of take a risk based steer from there and then go after the ones properly that mean the most of the business and just take a prioritized approach and work down the list. Cause I think that's, you know, outside of a holistic kind of central sort of database of, um, of, of, of kind of company risk or supplier risk where we can actually say actually somebody else has assessed this vendor can i take that assessment because i know how they've assessed them but i think that's starting to develop a little bit i think as a concept so but in lieu of that we just gotta we just gotta understand the ones that pose the biggest risk to the business if they were to if they were to have a breach themselves and, and kind of go from there I, mean, yeah, I, I, it, I, I was gonna say i'll lose um suggested some work the NTSC has done which we've put in along with Olu's suggestion about the um, CP&I work as well so Olu over to you yeah sure yeah that that the, the NCSC, NCSC thing is they've got 12 principles of um, supply chain um, type that it's a security but what I was going to say is I, I think of it in terms of people process and technology as well because if you look on the technical side um, you know everyone on the technology side everyone's using technology which maybe they've developed I don't know maybe 50 percent 60 percent 70 percent there's lots of libraries and, and open source stuff which is being used all throughout your supply chain so how on earth do you I was on a I was on another panel actually and we had um, a guy from Cisco who was talking about this and he he, um, he he I said it but he actually had a nice slide that showed how many levels deep there are in terms of the, the whole technology but then again you've got people I asked a, a large organization I said well what, what are you doing on your supply chain and they said to me uh, well our supply chain is is, is Microsoft and, and that's it they completely discluded right, all the people that walk in and out of their building, all the contractors, all of those other individuals who actually get access to, to their systems. And then when you understand what the risks are, you might find that you can mitigate quite a few of them just by flipping or changing your process. Right? Um, but you know, the understanding those risks, the risk assessment for me is, is really fundamental. Um, but have a look at those 12 principles. I think you should find those useful. But understanding what the risks are and you know, when, when you, when you, I mean, when you've asked that question that Lee asked, you know, well, what, you know, what, what's important to the business, uh, they'll say X, Y, Z. And then that provides you a good starting point, I think, to drill down with your risk assessment from there onwards to find, you know, to try and determine, well, you know, how, how, how could, how, how could, you know, is there any vulnerabilities or any weaknesses in this process or in the way we, we understand and work with our people? Um, but it, it is a, t I, I totally agree with Andrew, it's a tough one. But it's one which you must do something about because they only expect more um, attacks coming through the supply chain. Yeah, so that, it was just interesting to think when you ask the business what do they really care about, would any one of them ever have said log for j or solar winds? Yeah. And yet, actually, that's in the stack and it's in our supplier stack. And it's like, how would we ever have identified that until it went wrong? It's yeah. it's. It yeah, say, it's, it's, it's a holistic okay. approach and say there's kind of an yeah. IT approach and then there's a vulnerability approach and there's a threat bit to it and then there's uh, um but yeah, I think I think yeah, you you're right, third party suppliers, you know, we all went out and did it for log four J. Business didn't know anything about it unless there was rest of the business. And again, how 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 did that flow up or flow down? How do you talk to the business about log four J? There you go, there's a challenge for kind of technology kind of I centric tried. people. Good luck with that one. <laughs> I tried actually. I wrote one pager on Log4J and sent uh, at one point in time, and I, I, I sent that to a board. Um, did it? Did it have any impact? Um, I got a report back from so another part of the business says, "Oh, we're fine." So I said, "What about supply chain?" In fact, I put the supply chain into one pager. I don't think it was even looked at. To be honest, it's a challenge. I think it just opens the it just opens the eyes to a whole sort of new landscape of threat, though, doesn't it? Really. 
It's like, what, you mean we're using code from other people? Yeah. I didn't realize that. It's like, yeah, yeah we are, absolutely. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's one it's, of the things you've got to have. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's a massive challenge. And then the other thing, you know, I've, I've worked several major breaches, both in previous sort of end user roles and also in cons kind of consulting days. And I remember doing some due diligence against one supplier. It was brilliant. ISO 27001, two, um, they had lots and lots of certificates. Um, and I was asking questions around, well, what do you log and how do you monitor your systems for potential breaches and things like that? And the answer was, hmm, your logging is not great. And uh, and yeah, we don't really do much monitoring either. Um, so it was it was great on that hand, but on the other hand, and and yeah, I think it was GDPR plus about three days. Um, they announced uh, they they had a major breach. They were shutting down their systems, um, which effectively left the organisation I was working with um, unable to recruit um, anybody um, or. Or, or on board anybody um, because of the, the the HR systems that have been outsourced for weeks and it caused massive massive business disruption yeah. and so yeah it, it's it's all about being appropriate to the impact but then actually asking the right questions um, and that I think is the challenge because the questions have got to be appropriate to the service they're providing and and the detail is relevant to the impact that, that they would that would be to your business if they were to have an issue. Um, so it's a hugely complicated area. Um, but again, just, just getting back to the basics, starting from the highest risk vendors to your business has to has to be the way forward because it's there's, there's a lot of service providers coming out now. We're talking to a few service providers um, about everything from sort of automated um, sort of assessments based on that sort of bit site type data right through to go and here's a bunch of questionnaires go and talk to our suppliers on our behalf um so i think there's an emerging market with a lot of companies offering some actually pretty good support in this area as well and um, they can kind of help guide and take you through the journey um, and we we've, we've kind of ended up with a bit of a hybrid model ourselves um okay. yeah it's a massively evolving industry third party risk management companies are, are booming right now and probably rightly I, so I, and sorry, also i guess I'm sort of a fan of those models like BitSight and stuff. They give you some insights, but I've always sort of suggested it's a bit like judging the health of your dog by how fluffy its coat is. You know, its coat's looking healthy, therefore it must be healthy. It's like, it's it's an indicator, but it's not the whole deal yeah. at all. Don't, don't, don't believe the hype. I got, Again, yeah. back to vendor being the root cause of the problem as to why we are where we are as an industry. It's a, a lot of that stuff, right? Well, some of these third party risk problems, no, you won't. You'll provide an indication of something that might be useful maybe <laughs> once or twice a year, right? You're not going to solve the third party risk problems. And, and one, 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 so, one, so, one, I was just going to, sorry, I was just going to try and um, sort of, progress it because I'm not sure we've finished before the hour and, we, and the debate is going well but we're at the subject <laughs> we need to touch on. I've just uh, links come through about also some supplier supplier relations standards we have from ISO IEC as well and I just want to sort of transition to the next uh, point because I mean um, Ollie's sort of flagged up some of the great work that NCSC does and CPNI do, do. Um, and also in terms of this particular area the government did a, a consultation on supply chain resilience I think last September. Right. Um, so, I mean, just from your um, perspective, and as time will go on, it's obvious that government's um, reach is going to decrease because there's so much that's happening, you know, you know tax revenues are going to go down. Where do you think um, government should be focusing at the moment to have the most impact around cybersecurity? We obviously have the strategy which came out um, sort of about a year ago now, but, you know, where do you see in the coming where do you see this year and two or three years, there should be a, more of a focus from government around cybersecurity? I think from my perspective, um, so I, I, I've, read, I've looked at the, the, um, the NCSE strategy, um, I looked at the government's own strategy, they both published strategies 2022 20, 20, for the next three years, et cetera. Um, and, and, you know, I, I mean, it looks great. I mean, it looks fantastic on, on paper. If you read those strategies, if you look at the summaries, uh, how have you engaged with them? They look fantastic. Uh, of course, the, the the proof will be in the eating, right? Of, um, and it will be seen. And it will be seen. You know, it's yet to be seen how effective uh, they will be implemented. But um, one of the top things I think is is getting people out there. We've for some years now we've seen a shortage of skills in the in our digital space, um, but in cybersecurity um, as well. And I think um, you know, if there was one thing I was to really underline more than anything else, it's got to be getting the people out there with knowledge and skills. Um, who can integrate and work with companies um, to try and improve their, their security posture. 
Yeah, I'd, pro I'd probably ab absolutely second that. I think, you know, the government can play a massive role in doing that. Um, I do a lot of work with the Cyber Resilience Centre. Um, and again, part of that objective is to really look at how do we how do we make security attractive um, to, to kind of the younger generations. Um, the other thing I'd add to that is probably national critical infrastructure. Um, you know, that's key. Uh, to survival of the country and and you know the, the security of that I think is is absolutely within the government mandate to to prioritise that I think it is um, and I think there is a lot of good work going on in there so for me those two things I, th I think there's opportunities for improvement though to be frank um, cyber essentials is a good example of something which is is a laudable goal but actually I think has got a lot of opportunity for for being made more scalable and more uh, more appropriate for larger organisations, which it's now being applied to. You know, Cyber Essentials now has to be applied to critical national infrastructure organisations, and the requirement to patch something in 14 days in critical national infrastructure is a major challenge. So um, I think there's there's still opportunity for improvement. I mean, you know, we've touched a lot on, on, on um, the next topic about evolution of attack methods, um, and I think as you know, I, I looked at the survey as well, I think we said quite a lot about the phishing and still it's still 83 percent of um of attacks but there's obviously this concern about um ransomware i mean you do you have any sort of sense about the way that attacks are going and what we see more of in, in the future particularly as you know we've settled down to more of a sort of hybrid approach to working as well it's it's honestly it's still email is the major attack tool it really is. I mean, 75% of ransomware starts with um, with email. That was from Paolo Alto. They came up with that stat. But you know, it's it is the perfect attacker's tool. You know, we said earlier about the human being the primary attack surface, and the attacker wants to get to that. So, what would they want apart from a free tool that everybody uses that is infinitely scalable that the that the victim will happily engage with? It's email. It's the easiest way to get your content to the user to get them to engage with it, whether it's a link, whether it's a detachment, or whether even these days um, you know, it's a telephone call. You're putting emotional stress on them to make them phone you back and request malware. It, email is, is still a massive part of the, the threat landscape still. And there are obviously other options too, but uh, you know, from my perspective, we just see a lot and lot of email. Well, what, I, what I'd add to that is, um, I think it was mentioned earlier on, um, possibly by Andrew or, or maybe Lee, is that because of our, uh, you know, I say our, um, our, our love with social media and even LinkedIn, which is considered, you know, the most business-like of all the networks, you can glean so much information about an individual, huge amounts. And what it takes for someone to click on an email is maybe two or three pieces of information which you know really draw you in because they seem personalized you know we've seen an increase in in spear phishing i don't know i don't think that they've broken out those phishing stats that you that you refer to andrew but you've seen a lot of increase in spear phishing um and yeah. and um another one which um i gave a presentation on just before covid actually i gave a talk on um, down in london was the whole thing of deep fakes now um, we're seeing that we've seen that a lot in revenge prawn Porn at the moment, but um, yeah. there's the fake, there's some infamous case of the um, energy chief in the UK who wired 250k across to what he thought um, was a, a, an organisation which his boss had told him to do so. In fact, it was um, someone using uh, AI to synthesise a voice which sounded just like his um, just like his boss's voice. Um, he didn't. I don't think he wired the second tranche along, but um, I think we'll see. We'll probably see a lot more of that as well. And particularly as individuals um, begin to engage a lot with a lot of these AI face, um, both face and voice synthesizers, which can accurately sound like, you know, I'm calling you, um, and you, and you can't tell the difference. And so you, you know, the, the phone call comes in, you think it's you, and actually it's not. It's AI think yeah, AI being used by an attacker uh, to get you to do something which you shouldn't be doing. I mean, if, if you think about somebody who works in finance, if they receive an email from the COO, followed by a voicemail from the COO, followed by a text message from the COO, followed by a voice video conference from the COO saying, pay that check, at some point they're going to pay the check. Yeah. And yet all of those can be faked these days. There's a, a huge opportunity uh, for attackers to continue to evolve the way that they're attacking our human beings. Um, uh, and it's going to get more and more difficult for us to actually you know, identify and prevent that because of the technology uh, advances that have been uh, have been put in place. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'd second that. I was sorry, Tim, I was just going to add very quickly because I appreciate time moving on. Um, <laughs> we're seeing a lot of um, sort of as a service now, aren't we, as well out there? Yeah. So oh, yeah. everything nasty as a service is uh, pretty much available on the internet to download for $50. So you're looking yeah. at some pretty sophisticated capabilities. A lot of the nation states, sort of American capabilities, are now available to purchase by a 12 year old who just decides they want to have some fun for a bit with daddy's credit card for 50 quid. So yeah, there's there's a huge change I think in that landscape as well. So it's not, you know, it's not the sophisticated attackers. It, mm. It's it's the it's sort of that lower lower grade of attacker, but using some highly sophisticated equipment. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd second the email stuff. The um, the people attack stuff absolutely. I mean, just in terms of some of the because it segues very well. Um, the next point, obviously. Um, I mean, just in terms of the things we've set there, I mean, I, and I've got a certain personal opinion about AI because I'm dealing with AI pretty much all the time at the moment. But in terms of um, zero trust, confidential computing, adaptive security, I mean, how, where are you with all those, particularly given some of the concepts, some of the things you said before about getting some of the basic things right first? I mean, how important are those um, three things on you know, either of your organization or the organizations you, you're dealing with? Uh, Andrew, do you have a view on those? I guess from it's machine learning is the key that's making is the thing that's making the biggest difference to us in our organization because we are a security company. So we use machine learning and AI to, to go through all of the different attack vectors we're seeing and pull out the, the threat vectors, pull out the the uh, outliers, pull out the things that we should be looking for, it enables you to go through with much more scale and much more accuracy. So definitely machine learning and AI has got a really big potential to help most organizations get through all of the alerts that they're getting from everywhere across their enterprise and, and sort out the wheat from the chaff. But I guess adaptive security is, is the next thing that I would sort of stress out of those ones, to be able to apply um, the appropriate control in the appropriate circumstance to a user just enables you to sort of get out of their way a bit. So if they're logging on from the same home that they've logged on every day for for the past six weeks, then perhaps you can just allow them straight through with you know, just a password. However, if suddenly they're logging on from a different location or they're traveling, then perhaps asking for MFA is, you know, is a better idea. If suddenly they seem to change location in the middle of a session, then definitely asking for MFA and perhaps restricting any access to anything else would be a good idea. You know, being a bit more dynamic regarding the controls you put in place, depending on the, the risk that you perceive from the, how they're working with you, I think is an important thing to be able to do. So adaptive security and, and MLAI are two of the sort of key things for us in our organization. Lee? Uh, I question. If, I, I still. I always ask a question when I see AI. I'm pretty sure it's still just a marketing buzzword. Um, uh, it's, it's just not actually a thing, as far as I'm concerned. But you're right. Machine learning. It, it's 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 really important, and um, we applied it um, pretty effectively to our email gateway. Um, I think that's been an incredibly effective application of that technology. Um, we've seen a huge decrease in phishing coming through the back end um, by the application of that. Um, I go to adaptive security. It's one of the first things that, that I, I put in when I started a couple of years ago was how do you do that continual risk assessment of those users trying to access things, whatever it is they're trying to access. Are they coming from local network using a trusted machine um, and they got the password right the first time round, um, then great, you're probably okay. What are they accessing? Well, they're accessing some data set or some application we're not too bothered about. Great, fill your boots, crack on, not too bothered. Yeah. Is it coming from Nigeria? Well, no, all right, we're not even going to set out with the barge pole. If it's coming from some middle ground, then you might just want to do MFA plus, plus password control. Plus actually you might then want to ask them a few security questions um, as well depending on that. So it's that risk-based, that, 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 as you say, it's that automated kind of risk-based assessment, especially from a, a people and access perspective. Um, and again, that, that kind of sits to me alongside the zero trust thing. You know, that's really about only allowing the right people, the right access to the right stuff at the right time. So enabling the business to have access to everything that they need, but making sure that we're doing, um, you know, we, we're doing the relevant due diligence and the relevant risk-based controls um, around the people. Um, and the other thing I'd add to this, and I think really where we're moving towards is continual risk and trust assessment. So the, I think there's a Gartner thing called Carter, um, not taking it prescriptively, but being able to continuously test our controls against the threats that we face 
that's a really big one for me because that allows us to get very, very focused on what it is that we're fixing directly relevant to the threats that we face. And that allows us to build on top of some of these capabilities and some of these building blocks and start to really think about answering the broad question of, are we secure? So there's a lot of emerging technologies in that space that are, I think are going to be a game changer over the next few years as well, that, that sort of fit across all four of those and, and other categories as well, especially in the realms of testing, test, test and test. So, I mean, just in terms of the time, I want to quickly sort of move on to the last section um, around legislation and regulation. So we have the NIST directive will be updated at some point soon. Data protection for the UK may get more strict, may get more lenient. So. Um, just for uh, quickly for the three of you, where you know, what improvements in regulation would you like to see? Um, Ollie, do you want to go first? Well, um, the the NIS um, directive, um, you know, it's been out for um, been out for the consultation. That if that feedback's been assimilated. I'll be interested to see uh, what comes out of that. Um, it's trying to get the right balance really between. Um, apparently, if you legislate something, then you'll see increased improvement than if you just make if it's just voluntary. Um, at the same time, if you bring too many businesses into that, um, you know, in, into that fold, then you're, you're increasing a lot of red tape. And, and can the smaller guys handle it? The smaller businesses. Um, so it's a quite delicate balance to get. But I think that it's the right thing to do. Um, we'll have to see how, how that works out. Um, and you know, in terms of the best practice, then I'm a, I'm always for best practice, absolutely. That the key thing is, though, of course, is that when you when when you speak to an organisation and they've got you know these badges, um, I mean, I'd still speak to them, query them about the badges. For example, if you get ISO 27001, you know, you can you can draw a scope around that. Some people draw a scope around the smallest area of their business so that they can get the badge and they market the badge as though the whole organization has it. So still speak to them. But absolutely. Um, you know, and, I, and I'd hope what the BSI will begin to do is to market these, the, these standards as best practice. You know, it's helping you. Um, but don't do it just to increase your marketing. In fact, you know, don't do it at all to increase your marketing appeal. Do it because it's the best thing for you to do for your organization so that you get the real value. Um, I, I think we, we do encourage organizations to use standards for the right reasons. Um, yeah. I hope so. Yeah. Um, if, if you don't mind, the three of you, I will go straight to summaries. Um, and I'm very keen for you to sort of come in with anything else, your, you, your final thoughts. I mean, today's absolutely brilliant. We've covered so much in such depth with such passion. It's been brilliant. Um, so, I mean, Andrew, do you have any sort of closing things you'd, you'd like to say to, to us and the audience from, from our um, stuff we covered today? I guess it's um, that we've we've covered. I should say we've covered huge amounts, really. Um, I would I would go back to the the human factor thing. It is my passion. It is the thing I talk most about. But it, I think it's just so vital to organisations. So if you're a security leader in an enterprise, look at who covers your security awareness, behaviour, and change um, program, and see what you can do to elevate them, to give them more skills, to give them more insight into the, the behavioral science that sits behind this. That would be one of my key recommendations. Another would be actually, honestly, stop calling it security awareness. And I, this is a really simple thing, but I tell this to everybody, because security awareness, if you use that as the mantra, that drives you down a certain track. It drives you down a certain understanding and puts certain, you put certain things in place. But it's not about awareness. You know, we look at people who smoke, it's 100% awareness that smoking will kill you and still thousands of people do it, millions of people do it. It's not just about awareness, there's more to it. So start calling it a behaviour change or a culture programme and try and refocus on what you're really trying to achieve because there's a, there's a lot that can be done differently if you start to change your mindset regarding the, the human side of, of cyber security. I just think there's that huge imbalance right now. So much of the risk comes from the human side and so little of our budget and attention goes on that. And I think it's down to every one of us in the security industry to run, try and rebalance that and we'll get a better level of control across our enterprises. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, Lee, any final perspectives from yourself? Yeah, I, I, I think I think for me it's kind of going back to that touching on, you know, this this is a it's a it's a business issue that needs business support to solve. It's, um, you know, we're, we're not going to do it from within IT. You know, we need to be thinking about risk. We need to be thinking about um, alignment to the business. We need we need to be speaking a business language, and it's that it's that strategic sort of business vision piece I think that that we miss. So I'd encourage anybody to you know, and um, that, that maybe is more technical to to go out and, and maybe 
you know, pick up some new skills or certainly get closer to the business um, and just understand them and um, just understand them and the way that they work. And I think that will that will certainly help enlighten, I think, on, on some of the kind of the, the strategic priorities. Um, and then I think the, the other bit really for me where, where I'm, I'm, I'm sort of very passionate about it, is testing those controls. Um, and ironically, I'm not actually a massive fan of, um, of fishing testing um, of people. Um, but I, I think we need to have a look at the controls that we have or what we think we have and test those. Um, so I think as we look to evolve sort of security strategies, I think they will, they can and will become a lot more, um, a, a lot more targeted, a lot more specific and be able to demonstrate a lot more value to the business um, a lot more directly against the threats that we face. Um, so yeah, a couple of slightly different things there, but they're, they're two biggies for me. And Arlo, for the closing um, remarks of the conference, I would say um, get that board, get the board on board. All right, um, uh, the governance has got to happen, um, um, and the board have got to be made to understand they're directing the organisation, that they're, they're, they're sort of allocating or signing off the, the resources. Uh, without resources, you know, it, uh, an organisation is it, it could, could become a sitting duck. So get the board involved, and when you're looking at increasing security, I totally agree with what Lee said about the culture. But involve your staff, please involve your staff, um, and and don't and on that board engagement thing, um, don't think that you're too small an organisation or you know uh, too insignificant an organisation to be able to deal with it, or that the organisation is so large that you think they'll never listen to you. It's critical for any organisation, um, and you know it's only going to get more critical. I feel as time goes on. Thank you, Raj. As to bring it to a close, I really want to thank our speakers. That's been absolutely brilliant, uh, passionate, I would say, debate covering so many different subjects in such depth. So thank you, Olu, Andrew, uh, and Lee. Um, I also want to thank my um, BSI colleagues for putting the, putting the event together today. Um, so we'll be sending out a link afterwards with uh, an email with the link to the recording and the presentations that you've been used, so essentially these slides. Um, and please, uh, fill in the uh, feedback survey, survey and tell us anything else you want us to do in the future. Thank you very much and goodbye.